Hello, everyone, and welcome to this Canyons U Bite Sized PD. Today, we are going to be talking about writing effective test questions. This is part two of assessing your assessments. I'd like you to take a moment and look over our professional development norms. I know many of you are familiar with our professional development norms at Canyon School District. Everything that we do at ISD and in Canyon School District ties back to our MTSS framework. This particular bite size PD is connected to student performance data. That's what we will be focusing on. These are our learning intentions and success criteria. So our learning intention is, today you are learning how to write effective multiple choice test questions. You're learning this because writing effective multiple choice test questions actually is a skill. I didn't know that before I worked on this PD. So that's kind of been a fun thing for me to learn. The success criteria is, you will know you've learned this when you are able to apply the skills you've learned today to write effective multiple choice test questions. Our agenda today is to talk about the advantages of multiple choice questions, constructing an effective STEM, constructing effective alternatives, and additional guidelines for multiple choice questions. Our resource from, um, from our, for, sorry, our resource for today is writing good multiple choice test questions. And there's a link here in the presentation for you all to be able to access later. All right, first topic, writing good multiple choice tests. Multiple choice test questions, also known as items, can be an effective and efficient way to assess learning outcomes. And we talked about learning outcomes in part one of this Bite Size PD series. Multiple choice test items have several potential advantages. They're versatile, they're reliable, and they're valid. What I'd like you to do is stop your recording, um, if you're watching this at home or at school, and I'd like you to look at the expanded definitions of each of these advantages on your own and think about which advantage stands out the most to you. Welcome back. So think about which advantage stands out the most to you as a classroom teacher. One of the advantages that I like the most is reliability. The idea that reliability is defined as the degree to which a test consistently measures a learning outcome. All right, moving on. The key to taking advantage of these strengths, however, is construction of a good multiple choice item. So a multiple choice item consists of two things, a problem known as the stem and a list of suggested solutions known as alternatives. The alternatives consists of one correct or best alternative, which is the answer, and incorrect or inferior alternatives known as distractors. So here's an example of STEM, a STEM and alternatives. So if you're watching this on your own, pause for a minute and read the STEM and alternatives. Welcome back. So you can clearly see the first part of this question is the STEM and then the alternatives with one being the correct answer. So how do you construct an effective STEM? The STEM should be meaningful by itself and should present a definite problem. A STEM that presents a definite problem allows a focus on the learning outcome. 
So think about that learning outcome that you want and think about the STEM being connected to that. A STEM that does not present a clear problem, however, may test students' ability to draw inferences from vague descriptions, rather serving as a more direct test of students' achievements of the learning outcome. So that might be a more challenging or difficult question. So how do you construct an effective STEM? This STEM is not meaningful. So pause the video and read this STEM. Okay, welcome back. Some of you might be a little surprised. Which of the following is a true statement? I'm going to be honest. I have written a lot of test questions with this as the STEM. It's okay. Um, it's kind of a true false maybe type question, a basic recall question. So if you're like me and you're thinking, oh, geez, I'm kind of feeling a little bit bad that maybe I haven't been writing good multiple choice test questions, that's okay. That's the whole point of this PD. So maybe let's look at one that's a little bit better. So go ahead and pause the video and look at this one. Okay. And oops, sorry, let's go back. Why do you think this one's better? So we'll go back to, it's like when you're at the eye doctor, better one, better two. But what do you think makes this one, what characteristic is relatively constant in mitochondrial genomes across species versus which of the following is a true statement? If we go back to the definition, I think it has to do with this idea of the STEM should be meaningful by itself, right? And allows a focus on the learning outcome. So if you look at this better STEM, the mitochondrial genomes across species is most likely connected to a learning outcome. Okay, onward to the same topic on how to construct an effective STEM. The STEM should not contain irrelevant material, which can decrease the reliability and the validity of the test scores. Remember, this whole idea of multiple choice test questions is that they are reliable and valid. So we want to keep them that way. So this particular um, STEM has a lot of irrelevant material. So go ahead and pause the recording and read the STEM. Okay, welcome back. One of the things that stands out to me in this particular um, STEM is that a lot of this irrelevant material might be really overwhelming for students and might be really confusing. What else stands out to you about this STEM in relation to how students might feel about this particular STEM or how it connects to irrelevant material? Three, the STEM should be negative, the STEM should be negatively stated only when significant learning outcomes require it. Students often have difficulty understanding items with negative phrasing. If a significant learning outcome requires negative phrasing, such as identification of dangerous laboratory or clinical practices, the negative element should be emphasized with italics or capitalization. Now, I know that um, AP tests often use um, negatively stated questions, so sometimes you know, you have to provide students with learning opportunities to be familiar with those. But a good rule of thumb, according to this source, is that maybe that isn't the best um, type of STEM to create. So let's look here. Go ahead and pause the video and look at these types of negative phrasing and then a better use of negative phrasing in the middle. Welcome back. Why do you think the box in the middle has a better use of negative phrasing as a STEM? 
One thought might be is that it doesn't necessarily actually use a total negative phrasing. Like the box on the left says, which of the following is not true? The box on the right says, all of the following are true about mitochondria except. But if you look at the one in the middle, it says a water type extinguisher is suitable for putting out a fire caused by burning all of the following except, it still has the except, but it provides more context, which might be better. It has more of a learning outcome tied to it other than just which of the following or all of the following. Okay. Next, the stem should be a question or a partial sentence. A question stem is preferable because it allows the student to focus on, focus on answering the question rather than holding the partial sentence and working memory and sequentially completing it with each alternative. The cognitive load is increased when the stem is constructed with an initial or interior blank. So this construction should be avoided. So they provide an example here on the left of an interior blank. So they're suggesting that that's more complex. So in addition to the nucleus blank R, that provides more um, rigor in a question. Not that it's not okay to do, it's just more challenging maybe better would be in addition to the nucleus, which organelles contain DNA. So a question. All right, moving on to alternatives. All alternatives should be plausible. So realistic, right? The function of the incorrect alternative is to serve as distractors, which should be selected by students who did not achieve the learning outcome but ignored by students who did achieve the learning outcomes. Alternatives that are implausible don't serve as functional distractors and thus should not be used. Common student errors provide the best source of distractors. So these are examples of implausible alternatives. Who gathered the data that helped reveal the structure of DNA? Well, probably not Snoopy. Right, and so kids like those because they're like, oh, obviously not Snoopy. But when we're thinking about a reliable and valid multiple choice test, we wanna make sure that our alternatives are, you know, meaningful distractors, plausible. Alternatives should be stated clearly and concisely. Items that are excessively wordy assess students' reading ability rather than their attainment of the learning objective. So these are wordy alternatives. The term hypothesis as used in research is defined as. So again, this helps us know a student's reading ability, but maybe not necessarily a learning intention or outcome. Alternatives should be mutually exclusive. Alternatives with overlapping content may be considered trick items by test takers, excessive use of which can erode trust and respect for the testing process. So overlapping alternatives. How many chromosomes are found in a typical human cell? 12, 18, 32, 46, 54. Note the alternatives are overlapping because a cell that contains 18 chromosomes also contain 12. A cell that contains 32 also contains 18 and 12, et cetera. And four, alternatives should be homogeneous in content. Alternatives that are heterogeneous in content can provide cues to students about the correct answer. So go ahead and pause the recording and read this example. So if you go back, this is saying it should provide homogeneous versus heterogeneous content. And you can see the note at the bottom identifies the, the little answer here because option A focuses on a different type of molecule than items B, C, and D. It can cue the savvy test taker to the correct answer. 
Five, alternatives should be free from clues about which response is correct. Sophisticated test takers are alert to inadvertent clues to the correct answer, such as differences in grammar, length, formatting, and language choice in the alternatives. It's like, holy cow, do we have to remember all of these things? And students are surprisingly pretty smart about this kind of stuff. It's therefore important that alternatives have grammar consistent with the stem, are parallel in form, are similar in length, and use similar language. And six, the alternatives, all of the above and none of the above, should not be used. When all of the above is used as an answer, test takers who can identify more than one alternative as correct can select the correct answer, even if unsure about the other alternatives. When none of the above is used as an alternative, test takers who can eliminate a single option can thereby eliminate a second option. In either case, students can use partial knowledge to arrive at a correct answer. So those smart test takers that know the tricks can really benefit in those cases. Seven, the alternatives should be present in logical order, like alphabetical or numerical, to avoid a bias towards certain possibilities. So here's some examples. Go ahead and pause the recording and look at these examples. Okay. Additional guidelines. One, avoid complex multiple choice items in which some or all of the alternatives consist of different combinations of options. As with all of the above answers, a sophisticated test taker can use partial knowledge or achieve a correct answer. We kind of already mentioned that. But this is what we're talking about here. So I had in college, I used to have tests like this. I don't know if any of you had tests like this. But so here it's like A and B, B and C, A and C. Keep the specific content of items independent of one another. Savvy test takers can use information in one question to answer another question, reducing the vil vil <laughs> I can't say that word now, validity of the test. Okay, last, things to think about. There is a CSD assessment checklist um, in our part one of this series. Allison Duncan shared this as well. Um, our district has an assessment checklist that is also very helpful to use when writing assessments. So I just wanted to include that link here as a resource for you. And of course, I have a challenge for you. So take the guidelines that I've shared with you regarding writing multiple choice questions and either evaluate one of your existing multiple choice tests and make it even better or write a new multiple choice assessment. Thanks for joining this Bite Size PD. If you have any questions, my name, and I should have said it at the beginning, I'm sorry, this was my very first Bite Size PD, so I'm, I'm nervous and I'm new at this. But my name is Jody Ide, and I am a teacher specialist with ISD. I am over high school social studies. I'm more than happy to answer any questions or to help you um, with any of these new multiple choice writing skills. Um, please feel free to reach out. And thanks for joining or listening or watching the recording or any of the above. Thank you.